Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I am Thirumoy Banerjee and here's a look at the stories for the day. Artificial intelligence appears all set to shake the tech world. Old jobs will go and new ones will come up. A recent World Economic Forum report claimed that over 14 million jobs will disappear due to the adoption of new technologies like AI in the next five years. India too cannot remain unaffected. So is the Indian youth ready for this churn in the IT sector? Is the industry ready? Devargya Sanyal sifts through the numbers. The World Economic Forum or WEF believes that job churn in Indian labor markets will be lower than the global average over the next five years. Job churn or job change refers to the expected job movement, including creation of new roles and elimination of the existing ones as a proportion of current employment. This excludes situations where a new employee replaces someone in the same role. A recent report released by WEF suggested that the Indian labour market will witness a 22% job churn, compared to 23% worldwide. The churn in Indian labour markets will be led by technology-driven sectors like artificial intelligence and machine learning at 38%, followed by data analysts and scientists at 33%, and data entry clerks at 32%. While this seems consistent with India's digital push, a different set of numbers raise fears. The latest multiple indicator survey from the National Sample Survey Organization reveals a few shocking truths about the basic IT skills of India's youth. More than 70% of Indians between 15 and 29 years don't have the skill set of sending emails with attached files. Nearly 60% cannot copy and move a file or folder. The numbers are worse when it comes to other skills such as connecting and installing new devices or transferring files between a computer and other devices. What does this imply for Indian youth who are relatively new to the Indian job market or are about to enter the IT sector? Definitely deep implications for those who are entering the workforce at a time like this. Uh, because if our youth have the basic learnability skills, then they can be taught to learn whatever new technologies are coming up. First and foremost, we need to realize that we are uh, using technology. We can customize learning paths for different individuals. Second, it also helps with the fact that this learning is now at your fingertips, literally. You know, you don't have to deploy teachers on the ground in remote areas of India, uh, but you, all you need is basic hardware, a mobile phone. Thirdly, it is extremely scalable. So you don't, you're not, you're not constrained by the supply of talent when it comes to teaching. We need to unpack this uh, uh, challenge or issue in two parts. One is that uh, the basic, uh, the, the influence of technology in our day-to-day -day life and how adept we are. And the second part is that how you're actually consciously acquiring skill sets, which helps you get yourself employed. A large part of Indians do not still have, uh, you know, the influence of IT or technology, possibly. But I think in the youth, that dynamics completely changes. Uh, yes, now technology and skills or degrees or qualifications is still accessed by a small minority in the country. And if we don't ourselves acknowledge it and democratize technology education or access to the skills which are required, then we'll miss out on a huge opportunity. Meanwhile, labor-intensive sectors like accountants and auditors at 5%, 
operations managers at 14% and factory workers at 18% are expected to witness the least churn. So I think um, most organization hence will right now not get too bothered about churn or anything else. I think the only thing that they would focus on is that how we can keep whatever employee base that we have or the kind of talent solutions that we can have essentially it's the right blend of talent solutions to ensure that we always have access to the right skill set one of the biggest challenges the government faces is that while the government has organized job verticals the issues about employment and skills are horizontal cuts across all different ministries and while there are different initiatives the initiatives are not talking to each other to kind of fructify as achieving a common national goal I know there is a Ministry of Skills, there is a Ministry of HRD, but I'm not too sure. I mean, I, I, I commend some of the work that they are doing, whether they are able to kind of bring together the entire ecosystem as one. So, how can companies prepare for the job churn they will face? Is India's skilling ecosystem robust enough to rapidly fill in the demand supply gap? Experts point out that given that the MIS numbers captured the nation's reality for FY21, it would be incorrect to peg the demand supply gap in India's IT skills as alarming. However, they do underline that the government needs to take a more comprehensive approach to addressing the skilling needs, especially in the IT sector, to make sure that the demand supply gap can be rapidly remedied. Indian Cricket 2, it seems, is going through a churn. Virat Kohli's on-field spat with Gautam Gambhir has caught everyone's attention. But this is not a one-off incident. Indian Premier League matches are increasingly witnessing on-field aggression, like what we see on the football grounds. So is cricket then going the football way? Devargya Sanyal brings you the pitch report. In the first international T20 match played between New Zealand and Australia in 2005, the Kiwis and Aussies had entered the field sporting retro hairstyles and handlebar moustaches and had goofed around on the field. From fans to the players, very few people seem to have taken the format seriously. And so, when the 2007 T20 World Cup was announced, the International Cricket Council and its media team decided to play up this reputation. All its advertisements boasted how this was a big party. The game was much shorter now. There was more razzmatazz with cheerleaders and party music on the grounds. The gentleman's game, once the stuff of Sunday morning tea for old British gentlemen, was being played for a younger generation accustomed to fast-paced sporting action. It was a subtle but definite first step for cricket towards the football direction. The first World Cup even had a bowl out for tiebreakers designed on the lines of a penalty shootout. A year later, India, the winner of the inaugural T20 World Cup, took the next giant leap. Designed on the lines of European football leagues and sporting a name reminiscent of a certain popular English football club competition, the Indian Premier League came wrapped in all the festoons one usually associated with European football. Player auctions, foreign players, teams based in capital cities, colourful jerseys and most importantly, a budget bigger than any other domestic cricketing event till then. With cheerleaders, theme songs and mascots, the party atmosphere was also reminiscent of another very different culture of football, the American Football Leagues. And in the 15 years since its inception, the IPL has inspired several cricketing nations to come up with their own leagues, the Australian Big Bash being the most famous among these. We also had a Champions League T20 for a brief while. IPL itself has entered the big leagues when it comes to sheer revenue numbers. In 2022, IPL became the second most valued sporting league in the world with a pre-match value of over $13.4 million. It is only behind the National Football League or NFL, whose per game costs about $17 million. That's followed by the English Premier League at $11 million. The major league baseball figures are roughly the same. 
Most importantly though, experts believe that cricket as a gaming culture too has taken up shades of football. The recent on-field spat between Virat Kohli and Gautam Gambhir was reminiscent of so many angry team huddles we have all seen on the football field. So, is the old gentleman's favorite becoming more aggressive and physical? I don't necessarily agree that it's particularly new because cricket has had this all the way through the years. You can go all the way back to the England Australia bodyline series in the 1930s. There was that aggression, there was that drama, and I think that is something that us as fans want to see. Like that's where the viewing figures come from because we want to see players who who care and who believe that, you know, that our team is our jerseys worth fighting for. As clubs become increasingly indistinct from each other because they are much more like a big business rather than a kind of quirky individual club, that's something that gives you the authenticity. Everybody wants to see this. This is exactly what we want to see. So I think it's something to kind of celebrate. And what are some of the major aspects of club football that league cricket will find difficult to replicate in the short run? This creation of franchises as trying to be kind of unique clubs in their own right rather than things that burn very brightly very briefly i think it's very difficult to create that part of it is it's passed down from generation to generation and for that to happen a club needs to be in one place and called one thing and have this kind of common thread that runs all the way through over time i think it probably can happen but it requires time it requires time to build up that loyalty to build up those stories and that meaning and that meaning doesn't come from winning and it means something by being consistent and having values and having something that is beyond sport for a long time Experts point out therefore that while it will take nearly 2 to 3 decades for league cricket to capture the frenzy and fan imagination not to mention garner the levels of fan loyalty that european club football usually enjoys top performing leagues such as ipl are definitely a start in the right direction Moving on to markets foreign portfolio investors have bought equities worth 10800 crore rupees in just four trading sessions of may With this, they have turned net buyers for three straight months. With a pause in global monetary policy in sight, especially after the US's Fed interest rate decision on Wednesday, will emerging markets see higher inflows? And where is India placed on the FBI's radar? Nikita Vashisht answers these questions in our next segment. Foreign portfolio investors seem to have regained confidence in Indian equities. After being net sellers during the first two months of 2023, they have cumulatively invested over 30,000 crore rupees in Indian stocks in little over two months. With the U.S. Federal Reserve likely approaching the end of its rate hike cycle, analysts see FPI flows veering towards emerging markets. Within them, India could be the preferred pick. This is because against a likely slowdown in the global economic growth, India is likely to grow at 6.5 to 7 percent in FY23. 23-24. FPIs are turning positive on iron ore depreciation too. In fact, it has touched 81.77 per dollar. And since the current account deficit has also been declining, it's a bit positive for Indian rupee, which is making FPIs bring more inflows. Uh, since we are near to conditional pause, as indicated by Fed, the inflows in India would be linked to merits or fundamentals of equity market. Also, we are not into overvalued zone, especially the well weather indices. Plus, the robust credit growth and the consumers spending are also making a good case for Indian equity to perform in medium to long term. We are likely to see this trend even in future, except small disruptions, if any, by any extreme global crisis. That apart, India's weightage in the MSCI index is down from its recent peak, making room for higher inflows. We believe. India is very well poised to capture this trend for a couple of reasons. Firstly, last year, somewhere in September and October, MSCI weightage of India was a high 16%, which currently has fallen to 13%, partly because of FPIs taking money out, partly because of the currency of India depreciating. And we think now both are set to change because we think that the Indian rupee Uh, would firm up to as much as 80 rupees 
because the crude prices as well as the commodity prices are a lot more weaker and the earnings are a lot more uh, resilient. This should lead to more flows coming into India. So if FPIs are set to increase their stake in Indian equities, which pockets could be on their radar? We believe the key overweight sectors where FPI would be looking at are largely two. Firstly, the banking sector. Why banking sector? Because we've seen a very strong loan book growth of as much as 15% in the last 12 months. And the banks are also improving their yield. The second sector where we, are, we believe there will be a lot of inflows coming in would be the capital goods sector. A couple of reasons here. Firstly, the Indian government in their budget has increased the capex spent for the country. Both PSU and the government spend should be as much as 4.9% of GDP. And secondly, we are also seeing some private companies giving capex, which is leading to very strong order book for the capital goods sector. An elongated pause by the US Fed along with reasonable valuations and better earnings growth visibility will keep FPIs bullish on India. However, countries like China, Thailand, Indonesia and Hong Kong would also be on the FPI's radar. On Friday, Q4 results and global queues will guide investors. Benchmark indices soared on Thursday, both in India and in other parts of Asia, after the US Fed's quarter point rate hike. Moving on, beaches of Panaji are decked up and are brimming with activities even in this hot weather. The city is hosting foreign ministers of countries which form Shanghai Cooperation Organization or SCO. But what exactly is SCO? Why is India a member? What is its significance? Tushar Verma decodes it for you. Shanghai Cooperation Organization or SCO traces its roots to the Shanghai Five Group, which was formed on April 26, 1996. Russia, China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan were part of this group. The aim was to address border security issues among the member states. In June 2001, Uzbekistan joined the group as well. It was then renamed as Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India, along with Pakistan and Iran, were inducted as observers in 2005. India continued to be an observer till 2017, when it was inducted as a full member of the SCO. But why did India join SCO? Why is this group important? Today, SCO has eight full members including India, four observer states and six countries as dialogue partners. Its focus since 2001 has been to address regional security issues. The main aims include strengthening of mutual trust, promoting cooperation in political, economic, scientific and cultural areas, stability of the region and most interestingly, creation of a fair and rational new international political and economical order. Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure or RATS is one of the key highlights of SEO which is also crucial for India. Its aim is to improve cooperation in fighting terrorism, extremism and separatism. It also allows members to share crucial and critical information that may help in tackling terrorism. Central Asian countries are rich in natural resources, including natural gas and crude oil. Being a part of an organization which focuses on Central Asia will allow India to form strategic alliances and improve its energy stability. This includes facilitation of a long-dreamt Turkmenistan-Afghanistan-Pakistan-India pipeline or TAPI pipeline. This is a natural gas pipeline which if constructed will greatly enhance India's energy requirement. Being a member of SCO, India also has access to markets in Central Asia and Eurasia. Not only will it help facilitate trade and commerce, but it will also provide India with a platform to command a strong international presence. Trusted Bank, SBI, the bank of 
to every Indian. Pakistan's Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari is also attending the ongoing SCO meet in Goa. He is the first senior leader from the neighboring country to visit India in almost 12 years. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log into business-standard.com. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.